to. Uh, my name is Brendan Hannafin. I'm going to be your moderator today. I'll hopefully help you get your questions to Julie as she goes. Um, again, uh, please make sure you're muted. Um, after the, again, and also, um, it, this is taped, so these are recorded, I guess. So, <laughs> taped, showing my age. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and um, yeah, just be aware that you can watch it later uh, and type any questions you have into the box and I'll try to get to them. Um, I want to uh, introduce Julie Flanagan. I've known Julie for the 21 years I've worked in the county. So uh, an amazing resource. Uh, she's, she has over 30 years of experience uh, in the field of urban forestry, uh, first in Fairfax County and for the last 22 years, uh, Prince William County. So Julie, I guess we came on about the same time. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Uh, she holds a bachelor's of uh, science degree in forestry and wildlife management from Virginia Tech. Go Hokies. She has successfully identified, planned, and implemented 18 reforestation projects, returning native forest to over 75 acres of public and HOA land in Prince William County. Uh, we've actually had to work, we've gotten a chance to work together on a couple of those projects, and ho hopefully we have a couple more coming up. Um, uh, she, she loves restoring the land to its uh, forest is one of your favorite aspects of her work. So. Um, uh, with that, Julie, uh, I'll, uh, I'll take, take it away. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And there we go. Push everybody off to the side. Do you all see my uh, everybody's pictures off to the right? Because I don't want that to block the screen. Uh, Julie, it's it's fine. We can see okay. the screen. Okay. Julie, Thank change you. your view to presenter mode or the speaker view. Speaker view to presenter yeah. mode. Where you see everybody's uh, pictures in, yeah. in blocks so up at the top. Uh -huh. There's a there's a view in the black. Change it to speaker view instead of gallery view. It will that way when it records, it only shows you. Oh, okay. Oh, Thank you. Because I'll, I'll be talking. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started. Um, welcome to TREES, uh, reestablishing the cornerstone of our ecosystem. I am Julie Flanagan, the Prince William County Arborist, and it's really good to have such a wonderful crowd of people here today. Um, and we're gonna focus we're, um, specifically on trees and forests. So here's what we're going to cover today, as soon as this allows me to do what Alonzo. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and try again because that did not allow me to move the screen. There we go. Okay, um, here's our general outline. We're gonna cover the composition of a forest, why trees are the cornerstone of our ecosystem, tree planting and reforestation, practical tips, making the most of your investment, and then resources to help you plan and plant. So, um, before I get into uh, that outline, I'm just gonna pause and say, uh, these are two, um, a lot of people have questions about what can we put in our yard. My presentation is not going to go into specifics for what tree would work well on your yard. It's more of a broad view of uh, the why and, and some ideas for um, that you might be able to implement on your own property or in your neighborhood. So what I wanna do right up front is give you a couple of resources here and this slide will be on at the end as well. Um, of two resources I find really helpful that you can download for free online. One is Native Plants for Wildlife Habitat and Conservation Landscaping. Um, that covers the entire Chesapeake Bay region. Um, some of those may not actually be native to our area because that guide does go up into Pennsylvania and parts of New York, which might not be appropriate, um, might have some species in there that wouldn't be appropriate for us here, um, but generally very good guide, very thorough. And then Native Plants for Northern Virginia, um, that's this guy down here. And that one is um, only for the Northern Virginia region. It has um, several pictures in it to help you get an idea what the plants look like. And then toward the end, it has a rather thorough list of all different kinds of plants for our area. Online resources. I love the USDA plants database because when you know the species you're interested in, you can go there, put it in uh, as a search, and it'll specifically tell you um, that uh, whether or not it would give you a map that shows you whether or not that plant has been documented as occurring in our area. 
Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center includes only native wildflowers, and so they're a good resource. And then Plant Nova Natives is a fantastic local resource for all different kinds of information on choosing species, finding a nursery, getting a designer, all sorts of stuff. Um, more programs that you can sign up. Um, if this one is wet your whistle, you'll have a lot of opportunities to um, go to future programs that can help you learn even more. Okay, now I'm not, all right, I guess I got to click on the screen. So um, Virginia wants to be a forest. Uh, we live in the Eastern deciduous forest and that's an area that's dominated by broadleaf deciduous trees. And that means that deciduous means that they're gonna lose their leaves every year in the fall and go into a dormant period through the winter. Um, that we're in a deciduous forest does not mean there are not evergreen trees or even forests that are composed almost exclusively of evergreen trees. But it does mean that across the Eastern United States and particularly in our area, the deciduous forest is what tends to dominate. There are five basic layers to a healthy forest. Um, there's the overstory, the understory, the shrub layer, the herbaceous layer, and the leaf litter layer. And we're gonna go into each of these in a bit more detail. Let's start with the overstory. Start at the top and work our way down. This is the highest level of foliage. It's this carpet that you see across the mountains in the image in front of you. It forms a continuous canopy um, or usually a continuous canopy of leaves. Um, and uh, yeah, put you up there. Um, almost a continuous canopy of leaves. The species composition can change of, of that forest canopy and it, that is dependent upon the site conditions and the successional um, stage. So if you're in a, um, had an old field that's been left fallow and now that field is being allowed to convert into forest, the composition of the species that make up that old field will be very different from if you were to come back to that same old field um, 80 to 100 years later, you might see something that's really more in the lines of a mature, what would be called a climax forest, which is a very stable forest, a kind of forest that's able to replicate itself and keep itself in existence. And there wouldn't be some other stage of forest to replace it. Um, the upper canopy produces vast amounts of food for herbivores. And uh, that is where we've you've heard a lot today about um, the connection between native plants and uh, different, different kinds of wildlife, particularly insects. And that connection is most effectively done, uh, that connection is related to leaves and that connection is most um, obvious when you've got a huge canopy like this with billions and trillions and quadrillions of, um, of leaves available for herbivores to consume. Um, the overstory exerts a great deal of influence all of, over all of the life that lives below it. And we'll look at that in a, just a minute. So here are some of the main species of overstory trees, the trees that make it really tall and form that canopy. And what you can see right away in the parentheses are the number of species of um, within that genera. So oak is a genera, pine is a genera, ash is a genera. And within that, you have a number of species that occur there. And you can see from that, that the oak um, genera has the most number of species in our area. So oaks truly do dominate. But we also have many other um, species of trees that are dominant and are commonplace. Tulip poplar, you're probably familiar with, black cherry, um, and perhaps some that you might not be as familiar with, like common hackberry, which is a wonderful, um, produces a lot of wonderful fruits for birds. Underneath the overstory, we have the understory. These are trees that are smaller in nature by, or by nature. They are never going to be a really large tree. Think of something like flowering dogwood or a serviceberry or a common redbud. And those are going to compose that all over understory layer. But the understory is also going to contain the younger versions of the overstory species. So young American beech, young oaks, uh, young hickories. And they're just waiting there for their opportunity to get more sunlight and burst through that understory layer and try to become in, um, a member of the overstory layer. The understory layer is also a really important nesting area for many bird species. And in the lower left here, you see a nest of a blue gray gnatcatcher 
that's his tail sticking up there and probably her tail sticking up there. And then two of her wings just making over the edge. She forms her nest from, uh, coats the outside of it, they stick on there a lot of lichen, which are these light, uh, light colored areas and uses spider webs and things like that to make a very elastic and pretty much waterproof nest. She lives in the understory. Here's some understory species. American holly, which is a, a one of our most wonderful evergreen trees. Eastern redbud, ironwood, flowering dogwood, serviceberry, uh, black gum, pawpaw, hornbeam, sassafras, and there's actually many more. Um, these are just a few pictures to give you an idea of how beautiful some of these understory trees are. Some of them, their beauty is more subtle, like the pawpaw with this really beautiful maroon and green uh, flower in the early spring. And the sassafras, I just want to mention this one because you might think that's the fall color of the sassafras. But I mean, in fact, that picture was taken in early spring as the young sassafras leaves were emerging from their buds. So a lot of different seasons of interest with a lot of these plants. Now we're going to drop down to the shrub layer. The shrub layer basically occurs from ground level to about 10 or 15 feet above the ground. Like the understory, it is also very important breeding habitat for a large variety of birds. I'm just listing a few here with the American redstart, the wood thrush, and the ruby-throated hummingbird. But there are so many more that are breeders in the, under, in the shrub layer. Now, one of the things about the shrub layer you want to keep in mind if you want to put a shrub layer on your property is that it's because of its height, it's very subject to being over browsed by deer populations and heavy deer populations. And in fact, if you own a woodland, you may find that the shrub layer may be largely missing because of deer browse. So um, definitely one thing you can do is reintroduce those shrubs, but you're probably going to need to protect them until they can get uh, tall enough to be above the deer browse height. Here's some common shrub species. There's tons of them, and many of them are very um, beautiful. We have several viburnum. We have na native azaleas. Winterberry holly, you've probably heard mentioned a few times because of its absolutely gorgeous uh, winter berries. Um, the low bush and high bush blueberry, if you want to plant something that you might actually enjoy the fruit of yourself. We do have rhododendron, although they are rare and very specialized in their habitat. Mountain laurel, hazelnut, bladdernut, spice bush, there's just lots of them. And you can see from these that they are, you can get beautiful fall color from them, like the black chokeberry, along with very interesting fruits. This is the pinkster azalea, and there's some blueberries. And one of my favorites, this is Cyananthus virginicus, which is the white fringe tree, and that is it in full bloom, absolutely stunning. So down now to the herbaceous layer. And this is also what most of us would known as the wildflower layer. Um, in Virginia, in our deciduous forest, we have gorgeous wildflowers. And here's just a few of them you might find in a forest near you. Showy orchis, wood betony, bloodroot, one of my favorites, it, I have it in my backyard. Foam flower, very delicate. Yellow lady slippers, Solomon seal, large flowered Tyrlian, May apple and Dutchman's breeches. May apple is that wide uh, four-parted, five-parted flower or leaf there. And Dutchman's breeches are those look like little um, white pantaloons hanging from a clothesline. And then toad shade, one of our native Trillions, another of our native Trillions. And then last but not least, everybody's probably familiar with Virginia bluebells. If you're not um, there's a Bluebell Festival when we're able to all meet again um, in April every year, sponsored by Prince William Conservation Alliance. And this is um, what you can see when you go to the Bluebell Festival. Good news about bluebells, they love floodplains, but they don't only love floodplains. They actually can do very well in a garden soil, given light shade and decent moisture. The leaf litter layer, this is the layer that most people just sort of um, either don't appreciate or they don't even think about the value of it. Um, it is the layer where you'll find fungi, bacteria, protozoa, all sorts of microorganisms and some very small macroorganisms like the worms and insect larvae that live in that leaf litter layer. Um, they also, that leaf litter layer promotes the best health for your woody plants. It helps keep the soil moist during drought periods. It is a primary way which nu nutrient cycling takes place in the soil. And without that, you get a depleted soil. And it hosts symbiotic relationships that many plants are very dependent upon. 
It's also the habitat for a lot of ground feeders, ground nesters, and ground hibernators. So um, oftentimes birds will nest, or we have several bird species that do nest on the ground itself. Uh, they will not be nesting on a lawn. They will be looking for a leaf litter layer like they find in a forest floor. And the birds you see here are ground nesters. But also there can be turtles, which will hibernate, and the same with salamanders, will act, which will actually burrow down into um, a leafy layer of, this, of the forest soil and hibernate over winter. So um, that layer is um, something I can't emphasize enough. If you don't have that in your, around your trees and you can recreate it, do so. All right, so how do trees form the cornerstone of our ecology? Well, trees grow in communities that we call forests. And when they grow in those communities, they affect and alter numerous environmental factors, creating and sustaining intricate and diverse communities of other life forms. So when you have that canopy of that tree, the shade that it creates um, has a dramatic effect on all the life below it. And all the life below it is adapted to living under the shade of those trees. So that shade is a really key feature in what kind of ecosystem, what kind of plant communities you have underneath there. That shade creates cooler temperatures and that affects what plants can grow. There's organic matter because the leaves drop, they go to the ground, they add organic to the, within the soil and then on the top layer. There's a, a greater retention of soil moisture that we mentioned earlier and that fosters a, a very healthy microbial life in the soil, which is um, extremely important for the overall health of the, all the plants that live in that environment. And then the seasonal sunlight variations from a deciduous tree, a canopy where the um, leaves have dropped in the, in the fall and you have more sunlight in the winter and early spring. There are some species of plants that are dependent upon that, um, the losing of those leaves and they take advantage of that early spring environment where there's no canopy, no shade, but there's warm enough temperatures that they, they venture out from the soil and try to get their most important parts of their life cycle in while the, while the leaves are off the trees. And of course, if you have an evergreen canopy, then you have shade year round. And that is um, something else that will create a different set of plant communities because of that year round shade. Okay, so how trees form the cornerstone? Well, they create the environment that produces our healthiest streams. And they do this in many ways. First, they drop their leaves. So organic matter falls into the stream. That organic matter is the foundation of the food web within that stream system. The smallest of the creatures in that stream will begin to feed on that organic matter. And then other creatures that feed on those organic, um, those leaf eaters will feed on them. So um, that be, they're, they're the foundation and they're a crucial part of that system. The forest root mat is this intricate interwoven set of roots that hold the soil in place and prevent it from eroding into the soil and silting up the stream. Also, the shade keeps those streams, the water in the streams cooler and more constant. Without the shade, there'd be big swings in the temperature of water. And those swings are very hard for aquatic organisms to deal with. Um, also, cooler water means higher levels of dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is just like we have to breathe the air that's around us. Aquatic insects breathe oxygen through the water um, th that is in the water around them. Lower levels of uh, dissolved oxygen mean fewer um, aquatic insects. But shade and cools the water levels, cools the water temperature, allows more dissolved oxygen within the water and creates healthier insect populations and therefore healthier fish populations. So trees are the number one reason that neotropical migratory birds come to our region. Every year, millions and millions of birds leave their homes in South, Central, South America, Central America, and the Southern United States and move northward into the forests of the Eastern United States and Canada. And the reason they do that is to breed here. The reason they're breeding here is because our trees support very high populations of Lepidoptera and other insects such as spiders. And they, these birds are gonna use those insects to feed the next generation of songbirds. Um, trees are also very important to sustaining resident and wintering birds and mammals um, through supplying them with winter seeds, berries, and sap. So um, wild turkey, will be in our forests because there are acorns that come 
and are in the ground and they can harvest those during the winter. Similarly with holly berries that a lot of songbirds will eat and, and the like. Trees also create structures that many birds will rely upon for nesting sites and the nesting material and winter shelter. Uh, as an example, many songbirds will communally hide in a cavity of um, a tree in the winter and share each other's body warmth as they make it through the cold winter's night. So you may have seen this slide or something very similar to it in um, Alonzo's talk earlier. Uh, this is the le list of the 10 most valuable woody plants for supporting Lepidoptera. And you can see that oak tops the list. Um, these are all um, based upon data that was uh, accumulated in the Eastern United States. So this is very applicable to our area. Um, so all these are going to be genus that include all um, native plants. You can find non-natives in these genera, but stick with the natives. And you can support um, these types of Lepidoptera. Now I'm just going to, we're going to look at next at, here's the number of Lepidoptera supported by um, perennial plants. And you'll see that the numbers drop down significantly. Now I'm not going to tell you don't plant perennials. In fact, I'm going to tell you plant perennials absolutely do. But realize that if you're looking for plants that will give you the biggest bang for your buck, um, trees are going to do that. They're going to support a higher percentage or a higher number and a higher variety of Lepidoptera. Um, Desiree Narango is a uh, researcher that worked with Douglas Tallamy, and she did some research into um, how chickadees, uh, local chickadee populations were um, breeding and how successfully they were breeding based upon the amount of native plant biomass that was in a suburban yard. And what she found, I'll just go ahead and read this. This is um, a researcher discussing the results of her study. The researchers found that the only yards that were able to produce enough chickadees to sustain a stable population were those with a plant composition made up of more than 70% of native plants. That's key, more than 70% of native plants. Because more than 90% of the herbivorous insects will only eat one or a few native plants, the use of these plants in the landscape is essential to ensure breeding birds have enough insect prey to eat. And what he means there is that those breeding birds have enough insect prey, not only to eat themselves, but to bring back to their chicks. For the same reason, native plants are also likely critical for other resident birds, endangered species and migratory species, and not just in the backyards on the East Coast. So what Desiree found was that when that percentage of native biomass dropped below 70%, the chickadees breeding in those habitats could not produce enough young to replace the um, adults that would be dying off from year to year. So what can you do? Well, let's start with tree planting. And here I'm gonna just talk about taking basically an individual tree and putting it into a property, not um, trying to recreate a forest necessarily. Tree planting may be something that you will work best if you have a limited amount of space, such as if you're on a townhouse, a condo, or a village home. By village home, I mean properties that are less than 7,000 square feet in, in, uh, in space, in acreage. Um, there's a lot of benefits to tree planting, so don't discount this. If you can only put one tree in the ground, put it in and pick one of those native species that we looked at earlier, or native genera that we looked at earlier. You'll be getting a new canopy, um, which is which is very beneficial. If you don't have room to plant a new tree, perhaps you can replace a dead or dying tree with a native. Remember the high value of oaks. Um, they supported the greatest number of Lepidoptera. And then if you uh, maybe already have a tree and you're thinking about how do I improve my small property, well, you can certainly add the missing forest layers such as herbaceous plants, shrubs, and the leaf litter. Um, so you can always do something even with a small property. Now reforestation, and when I talk about reforestation, I'm speaking mostly about um, putting in the big bones, so to speak, of a forest. Put in those overstory species, the understory species, and sometimes maybe you're gonna plant shrubs as well. But usually when I do a reforestation, I'm putting in the overstory species and the understory species. And then we're gonna let that land go and let natural processes take place so that the eventually the leaf layer will form, 
eventually you will get shrubs that will voluntarily come into that area. And um, although perennials are, is another question which we can talk about later. Reforestation may be something you could do on a small scale if you're part of on your own property, or if you have a, a larger lot, or if you um, have HOA land that you can work with. So in the picture off to the right, we have a, um, single family homes that are next to a golf course. You can, this is the green, that nice smooth green area there. Then there's the sand trap with the, the rough next to it. I don't, they call it a really rough area, but that's the really rough area. And then we get to the homes. Well, if you owned a home there, you might be able to plant some overstory and understory trees on your property and then work with your HOA to see whether or not you could expand and do some work on that common area. Also keep in mind that whenever you have existing trees like these, um, the brown kind of fuzzy area there are existing mature trees. That's how they look from an aerial image. Um, and if, you, if this person were to plant on their yard, they would be connecting to an existing wooded area. That's extremely beneficial. Build on what's already there. If you don't have anything there, start building and be the person who somebody else can build next to. Like for example, if you could talk your neighbor into building well, then you could create even greater habitat and then um, create a neighborhood that is really thinking about how collectively they can improve the environment. Whoa, that is weird. That did not show up like it's supposed to show up. So we're gonna make do because I'm not gonna take the time to change it. So this is kind of distorted, but um, these townhomes off on the left are a subdivision that, um, allowed us to come onto their common area. Uh, that green outline is, I'm gonna use my cursor to show you, this is the common area of this townhouse development down in here and over in here and back up again. It was about a four acre common area. And it had an intermittent stream. The blue line is supposed to show you where that stream is, but I'll use my cursor. It's actually running right through here. An intermittent stream that in generally, throughout most of that area, it was just lawn when we went to this HOA. And we asked them if they would partner with us to reforest that area. And they said, yes. So um, I'm gonna pass that weird looking slide by and come to something very normal. So this is what their common area looked like before we planted, mostly lawn, scattered mature trees, but and an intermittent, intermittent channel that hold, holds, it holds water only portion of the year. Um, in 2012, this is what it looked like. By the time we went to them and got uh, permission from them to plant, um, they had, uh, it was 2013. So the first trees went in in the fall of 2013. This is what it looked like at the, in the third growing season in 2016. This is what I call the brushy weedy stage. Um, we did work with the HOA to help them understand that this was going to be a stage that the forest would go through and they were able to work with us and really minimize, help, help people understand that this was important stage. Keep your eye on these two uh, posts over here because the next image is going to be uh, show those two posts. So this is what that same reforestation looked like in its fifth growing season. And you can see that the canopies of these trees are starting to touch one another. And this is where that brushy weedy stage begins to disappear. And the area starts to look more like a true forest. Here's another example from Cloverdale Park. Not our typical reforestation because we did have a sloughing bank here that we um, graded back and fixed the eroding soils there. But uh, keep your eye on that tulip poplar. It's gonna show up in uh, other photos here. So this is what it looked like prior to planting. We did this with volunteers. In this case, um, our volunteers did plant some shrubs into this. We put the weed mat down to help control erosion. Not what we normally do. Normally we just use the tubes and the trees. We also um, killed the grass um, and then mulched afterwards. So here's what it looked like after planting, immediately after planting that uh, slope was taken care of, the tubes with the bird netting on them to keep the birds from falling down into the tubes. Here's the second growing season. Again, the brushy weedy stage. Now, I'm, if you're thinking about reforesting on your land, I would encourage you to embrace the brushy weedy stage because there's some really interesting things happening in here. Things that you don't pay for, you get free. What you get for free are fall asters. That's this white plant down here at the bottom. And here's, um, Bidens. 
uh, that voluntarily came in. Um, we didn't plant these things at all. Cattails voluntarily came in. There'd be a lot of other forbs in this area that voluntarily come in, come into that area. And before that area really closes its canopy, it's a great becomes a great habitat for pollinators in that sort of meadow form. And then here's what it looked like from before and then in the 13th growing season. Again, the same tulip poplar that you can see. And now you see that shade over the stream, which was basically full sun before. You see the shade, the stream even looks healthier at this point. And so um, I'm gonna go over now what we're um, looking at planting, what you might be able to get and use to plant. Um, we're gonna go from least expensive to most expensive. Least expensive is bare root stock, which as you might expect, you can purchase cheaply, but it comes without any soil on its roots. Because of that, it's gonna be wrapped in plastic and those roots have to be kept moist until you plant them. You can only plant them in the dormant season and you have to be sure that you um, take good care of those roots so that they don't dry out before you plant them. So you need to plant them pretty quickly. Next, you have what we call tublings. This little container here is nine inches deep and three inches on each side. The tree comes with the soil that it's grown in. So when you pull the tree out of that, it's got the soil attached to the roots. And I find I have a better survival rate with these tublings than I do with the, um, the bare root, although bare root is a good choice. Then we have gallon stock. This is gallon stock and on uh, one gallon, you get a bigger plant with that and a more expensive plant because of that. And then finally, whip stock. Now, these are probably like, um, I forget, three or five gallon uh, containers. They're called whip stock because they're grown. Most of the time when you find them, they're maybe four or five, six feet tall, but they really normally don't branch. The, in this case, these guys are fairly branched, but oftentimes they have no branching on them and they look like a whip. And I just love this photo because this is a family that came out and helped us do one of our plantings and they were just a delight. So practical tips and ideas. Make sure you think about putting the right tree in the right place. Um, one way to figure out if something's going to like the ground that you have is just see what's growing next to you. If you have woods close by, uh, I mean like really close by, then see what's growing there. And you can select some of those species to try in your yard. Make sure you think about the right size and shape tree for the space that you have and consider the rooting space as well as the canopy space. This is a beautiful white, white oak tree. Um, if you put this right next to your house, you might regret it after a few years because look how broadly that canopy can spread. And then don't plant trees under utility lines. The utility companies will always have the ability to come and remove those trees or hack them to pieces. They don't need to ask your permission. And if, you, if they kill them, they will not replace them. And it looks like we just got a note from Rob Johnson saying that the breakout sessions are gonna to go to um, 1210. So good, I don't have to stop right now, but we will definitely move along. Tree roots and grass versus mulch. On the left is an image from a study that the Morton Arboretum did about the a number of tree roots that grew under a mulch covering like you would buy at a home center compared to tree roots going under grass. And what they found that, that 10 times more tree roots would grow under mulch as under grass. So if you wanna do something really immediately and cheaply to improve the health of your trees, get rid of the, mul get rid of the grass and mulch. Mulch widely, not deeply. Um, about three to four inches of mulch is all you need and don't put it up around the base of the tree. Volcano, mul volcano mulching is a bad thing. More ideas. Take a soil test. Um, Virginia Tech Soil Lab will perform a soil test for you for $10. You can get the sample boxes from Cooperative Extension. I think some libraries will also have soil sample boxes in them and maybe some garden centers. If you live on A1 land, agricultural land, the Soil and Water Conservation District will do a soil test for you for free. And then um, when you're planting, you because we're in an, a suburban urban area, more than likely when your home was built, the soil, the top soil and the organic matter was removed and you were left with what are called dehorizing soils. If you in the process can bring back in topsoil and bring back in that organic layer, you will benefit your trees greatly. 
Incorporate na native berry producing trees and shrubs for fall and winter migrants and winter res residents. Um, that's something that helps you really enjoy the benefits of what you're doing year round. And the, this uh, on the left is a beautiful cardinal feeding on winterberry holly. Um, so that's a very good thing to do. And it, you, it's also a good idea, especially if you've got somebody else mowing your lawn, to define a border between the area that you want to be forest or that you're reclaiming for forest and the, your lawn area. I use a low ground cover like this dwarf crested iris. Um, it took a while for me to figure out what the garden, what the lawnmower guy recognized as was not grass so that he would stop mowing it. And this worked for me. Um, also control invasive species early on. They're so much easier to deal with before they become a big problem. And then lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Um, oftentimes we may have some uh, fears and biases that need to be overcome in order to make a forest a forest. Um, for example, people may be afraid that if they, if they have a brushy, weedy stage that they're gonna have snakes. Well, a couple of things. One, you probably have snakes already. Two, snakes eat mice, rats, and insects. So if you want um, something to control your mice population, snakes are just the right thing for that. And we only have one kind of snake that you actually need to be concerned about, the copperhead, as being a poisonous snake. All our other snakes are not poisonous and they're not harmful. Um, standing fed trees. These are great wildlife habitat and they don't really need to scare you. If they're near your home, if something that they could really do damage to, should they fall? Yeah, take that one out. But if they're not a threat to your home or your kid's play area or where you park your car, then why not leave them stand? Um, I had a dead ash tree in the, in the um, common area behind my townhome. And when, the, when it died because of emerald ash borer, we had the tree company come out and they didn't cut it down all the way. They left about 20, 25 feet of it standing so that it could be habitat. Um, there, and they are habitat for woodpeckers, wintering birds, cavity nesting birds, even dens for flying squirrels. And if you've ever seen a flying squirrel, it's adorable. And if you should happen to be so, one, so blessed as to have a great horned owl nest in one of your dead trees, well, you certainly wouldn't want to take down the habitat for that beautiful little bird. Down logs, maybe they look messy to you, but maybe we can rethink that. Down logs are actually excellent habitat. They contribute back to the topsoil and they have all sorts of life both on top of them and within them. Pileated woodpeckers are one species of bird that spends about 40% of its time foraging for insects on the forest floors and ants, they're big ant eaters, but they'll spend a lot of their time foraging on the ground. This one was pecking away at that piece of wood that it was sitting on. And then you can have moss and mushrooms and snails and a, a down log can become a really interesting place to go and look for life. Local assistance. Um, the Virginia Department of Forestry has regional foresters that can help you with managing an existing forest stand. And they can also, if you have enough land that you might be able to reforest for timber production, they can help you with that. The Prince William um, Cooperative Extension Office and the master has a master gardener help desk. There's their phone number. They are a great source of help. They also hold a lot of classes to help you learn more about gardening. And then the Soil and Water Conservation District has what's called a VCAP program that can help you with financial assistance for small projects in transforming part of your property into a native landscape. So that's the end of my talk. I'm going to leave this one on um, when I, but I'm going to escape out of this and stop sharing. Well, Julie, we have a lot of questions. Uh, All to right. go through. Let's uh, go for it. I'm trying to get to the beginning here. Some of them have been answered by our other participants. Um, well, we've got about 15 minutes or so. We so. have some time here. Uh, what flowers and shrubs are more deer tolerant? I, yeah, for that, I usually um, encourage people to find a list online because I'm, I'm not going to really be able to give you a really good thorough list, but I can tell you from experience, um, pawpaw and American holly are two uh, understory species that are going to be in that range where the deer can reach them. Um, they really don't like pawpaw or American holly. I've I've planted other things that are supposed to be more resistant. Some of the viburnums are supposed to be more resistant. Um, supposedly winterberry holly is more resistant. And honestly, I think when the deer are hungry enough, they'll go ahead and eat just about anything. So um, 
what I would encourage you to do if you got a deer problem is put some sort of fencing um, around a plant. And if you have the type of um, shrub or uh, understory, overstory tree that's going to get above the deer browse line, which is about four feet, four and a half feet tall, deer really don't browse above that point. So if you can protect your plant until it gets that tall, then you can remove whatever protection you have and the plant should do all right, um, despite um, deer browse. Yeah, and uh, Julie, I'd add to that the fact that um, in this area, you know, we we just have too many deer, so yeah. um, they are going to eat anything. I mean, they eat Atlantis if they if, if they have to. Yeah. So um, if you see misformed hollies that go about four foot up, yeah. <laughs> you'll know you have way too many deer in your area. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. We know that pin oaks produce acorns. Yes. Do they support any insects or mammals? Well, um, I don't know the specific um, uh, insects that would be on um, the pin oak, which would probably be true for most oaks, but um, they would be in that whole group of oaks that have a lot of butterfly larvae that feed on them. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not well versed in that. Um, that feed on the seeds, uh, there's a lot. Uh, fox actually will eat acorns. We mentioned wild turkey eat earlier. Um, bear will eat acorns. Uh, um, gosh, there's just obviously things like squirrels, um, flying squirrels, although they eat more insects than seeds, but um, flying squirrels could be there too. Um, so there's, there's a lot of um, wildlife that will munch on acorns. They're very, very, they're, call, they're called hard mast um, because they're not soft uh, like a, a berry would be, like say a black cherry fruit. Um, they're called hard mast, and there's just a ton of um, animals that feed on hard mast. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not really good at kind of, bam, I got a list in my head. Um, I'm not very good at that, so sorry, I can't uh, give you more details. I know the deer in Montclair like the uh, acorns as well, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what would, Julie, what would you consider some fast growing trees to consider? Faster growing trees, um, Red maple is a fast growing tree. Um, red cedar is actually relatively fast growing. Willows, we have black willow is one of our native willow trees and that's a very fast grower. Sycamore, American sycamore, tulip poplar, a fast grower. Um, there's probably one or more I could come up with if I thought about it a little bit. River birch. Uh, river birch is a really fast grower. And it's uh, on, all of these are, are great for, um, for bird population and lepidopter as well. Hey, I have a tulip popular in my backyard and I've been here 12 years and it's seems to have doubled in size in that amount of time. Yeah, we planted um, a, a floodplain in Ben Lomond Park and we planted it in 2014, I believe it was, and we just went out to do some maintenance. So it's six growing seasons into its life. And the sycamores and the tulip poplars um, were 20 feet tall, 25 feet tall. They were, you could walk underneath them. Six, you know, six years in the ground and they were loving that area so much, you could walk without having to bend over, you could walk underneath them. Now don't, I'm not promising that for your property. That is highly dependent upon soils and um, the amount of moisture that the tree gets. So you will get, and in some of these reforestation sites, we have, we're, we're 12, 15 years out and we haven't gotten canopy closure yet because the soils are very poor in those sites. So the growth of a tree, the speed of a tree's growth is very closely tied to the quality of the soil that it's in. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, trees, uh, Tree of Heaven, Autumn, Autumn, Autumn olive and Bradford pears are uh, non-native. Um, any suggestions to manage? Um, I think it's somewhat, it depends on how big the tree is. If you don't want to use an herbicide and the tree's relatively small, one of the things you can do is simply cut it down. It will have energy in its root system and it'll grow back. If you let it grow for a little while um, and then partway through the growing season, you go back and cut it again. Um, you may have to do that two or three times to deplete the energy in the roots, but you can kill a tree simply by going repeatedly and killing it, um, and letting it grow up for maybe a month or two and then cutting it down again, let it grow, cut it down again. And eventually you'll deplete the energy in the tree's root system. 
and it will die. Um, if the tree's uh, bigger, one of the things you can do, uh, say like maybe it's 10 inches in diameter or something like that, um, you can girdle the, tr the <laughs> girdle the trunk of the tree by taking something like an ax and cut off all the bark for maybe a two foot length um, along around the entire circumference of the tree, get down into the sapwood of the tree that carries the water. And what you're doing is separating the, um, the uh, energy source and the leaves from one of the major storage places in the roots. And eventually that tree is going to starve because it can't get the energy from the leaves down into the roots. Okay, uh, nine large oaks in my yard. This is from uh, Lanny. Uh, nine large oaks in my yard have died from oak wilt in the last eight years. I'm hesitant to replace them with oak trees as long as oak wilt was a problem, any hope for a prevention or cure. Prevent, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't think um, we arborists yet fully understand um, oak wilt. Uh, it's, it's something that's become an increased problem, increasing problem in, within the last decade or so. And it does hit, for those who are unfamiliar, it's if you've been noticing really mature oak trees um, relatively quickly dying, it's from oak wilt. We think it is um, caused by a uh, brown algae that is in the soil and on really wet um, years, really wet growing seasons, that algae has the ability to work its way up into the stem and the system of the tree. And, and then it can dry out and clog the tissue that carry water up from the roots into the canopy of the tree. And um, <clears throat> we don't have a cure for that algae yet, that brown algae. We don't have a treatment for that brown algae. I don't know that I would not plant an oak because it does seem to affect really mature oaks and not so much younger oaks. So we, you might want to plant and just in the hope that there will be some sort of um, treatment for that, you know, 10 years, years from now. Um, but you can certainly go with other, um, other native trees that um, uh, hickories, uh, hackberries, all, all sorts of things that you could do as a substitute. But I think we're still at least a few years out from understanding exactly what's happening. And then we have to understand what's happening before we can find a cure for it. Okay, this is from Carol. Um, do you get resistance from homeowners about the thicket of shrubs and trees that filled in after the first several years of the project reforestation? What we feedback did you get about the density of plant fill? Um, we use, uh, when we're doing reforestation, we plant usually seedlings. They're usually about 12 to 18 inches in height. Um, we plant at a density of 450 trees per acre. Some people will plant as low as 250 trees per acre. Um, but when we do that, we're also using protective tubes to keep the deer um, safe from, tree brow from deer browse. Um, if we plant Without protective tubes, we bump up our density to 650 trees per acre because we figure we will lose some of those because of deer browse. And so we're just basically kind of trying to give the, the, um, the deer more than they can, uh, they can possibly eat. Um, do we receive resistance? Yes, that is probably the biggest thing I do if I'm working with an HOA and I, we want to plant on them. We have talks about this is how it's going to, and I presume, Carol, you're, you're saying, you know, the, that brushy, weedy stage, or maybe it's just so thick that they feel like they can't get into it. It may be some, you know, criminals hiding in there. Um, yeah, the, um, the, the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional, when they do trainings, they actually are discouraging people from planting thick areas because they're getting pushback from people. And I just wondered if, you know, from, a, from an ecological standpoint, it's certainly wonderful habitat. But from the homeowner standpoint, I just was curious how you navigate that. Mostly education. We, we don't, um, well, the townhouse, the distorted townhouse picture that you saw was an, that community actually ripped out uh, the area we planted had a tot lot in it. That, that before we got there, the community ripped that out because they had drug dealers hanging out in the tot lot selling drugs. And when we brought to them the idea of reforesting this, they actually liked it because they thought it would be discouraging to people who wouldn't want to get in a tangle of a thicket to go and sell drugs. Now, that may be true, it may be not true, but they actually looked at it. They didn't have a tangle of a thicket 
and they were having drug problems. They had a wide open area and they were having drug problems. So um, I, to my knowledge, so far, there's been no problems on that property uh, with any new drug issues to the best of my knowledge. Um, but we do a lot of education ahead of time talking about how this is gonna be dense. And uh, we try to explain to them the ecological reasons for letting it be dense. Um, and so far, I really haven't had anybody say, no, we won't do that. Okay, I think that's the majority of the questions. Some of them have been answered as we've been going. Um, does anybody have any questions for Julie? Well, I'd like to mention that Julie um, and her team uh, reforested a lot of uh, the repairing area at Bristow Battlefield out in uh, Bristow on 619 and 28. And it's an excellent area. It's, there's trails on, that go through that area. It is an excellent place to see what we're talking about here, what Julie's been uh, about a major reforestation. How many acres, Julie, are we up to there? We um, just finished this past fall. Uh, in, in early December, we planted the last 10.2 acres, but we overall in the last three years, we've planted um, 28.7 acres, which is our, yeah, it's our, um, our biggest project to date by far. And um, since you brought that up, Brendan, um, we are always looking, I'm in the watershed management branch in Prince William County, and we are looking for places to reforest. Uh, we do have selection criteria, but one of the um, subdivisions that we planted, was, it's called Hunter Estates, it's off of um, Holdley Road in Prince William County. We planted 10 acres in their common area. Um, and because their HOA president came to a talk like this and was thinking, wow, we could do that on our property. And they were an excellent site. So if you know of an HOA, you've got common area, um, we can come in there and assess it. We can look at whether or not this would be a good candidate for us to plant um, reforest, reforest in that area. Uh, we, we are not going on to individual private lots. I'll tell you that right now. If you're hoping we'll come onto your individual lot and do that, um, we, are, we don't do that at this point anyway. Um, but we are looking at both parkland, um, county-owned land of various kinds, as well as common areas owned by HOAs. Really? This yes. is Mike Miller. Uh, I keep seeing this cicada question pop up. Do you mind if I answer that real quick for everybody? No, go right ahead. So with the, the emergence coming up, I wouldn't wait to plant there. The cicadas are part of the system every this 17 year emergence coming up this summer. The only real problem that you should see with uh, the cicada emergence on plant damage is what's called avi deposition and that's planting of eggs. Uh, they're not really going to go through and damage your fresh plantings. Uh, and that, that was for Cindy Spees. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, the, the, the damage is ov op ovipos ovipositing. They use, they have, the females are amazing. They have like a saw-like appendage that they can actually saw into a twig. And they, when they saw into that twig, they make a little flap and then they deposit their egg inside that flap. It's enough damage that from the point that they do their ovipositing out to the end of the twig, that usually dies. And so you'll see this coming year, you're gonna see mostly mature trees with uh, a lot of brown ends of their branches. And that's where the females have oviposited their legs, eggs. Those branches will drop off with the eggs, go down to the ground. And that's how the um, eggs of the cicada hatch. And then they burrow down into the ground and will stay there for the next 16 years. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's cool stuff. Um, we did have some damage. If you didn't hear it in the other session we were in, we did, have, we did plant a young tree we planted several young service berry out at Merrimack Farm Wildlife Management Area. The year, um, I think it was the same year that the last batch of cicadas came out and they did damage those young service berries um, and pretty badly actually, they, they struggled on from there. They may have, there may have been other reasons why the um, service berries were struggling, but the cicadas definitely did do some damage. So I wouldn't worry about if you're planting any perennials. The, the adults don't feed. They, they're not going to chew on anything, but they, the females will oviposit on twigs of woody plants. And so that's more what you would need to be concerned about. You're also going to see a, an emergent of a wasp that's called a cicada killer. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, these wasps are so big that they can carry these large cicadas, but they will not harm you. 
Uh, so please don't kill those. Uh, a, a lot of landowners are afraid of such large wasps. They, they got like a two centimeter stinger on them. Um, you can literally pick them up and they won't sting you. And since we have maybe one more minute, I'm just going to note, I see that Missy Kelly is in our audience today and um, she was uh, a community leader uh, in her neighborhood who took the lead in getting a portion of their common area reforested. And thank you, Missy, for doing that. It was a pleasure to work with you. And I hope you can inspire a lot of other your neighbors and NHOAs to do the same thing. Well, I know living in Montclair, one of the reasons why we moved here was because of the because of the amount of forested area and tree cover. So it, it's not a negative to a community to have, you know, a healthy tree stand. Right. Uh, we really need to change how we think about um, a yard, how we think about a suburban yard. And um, the, that whole lawn, I hope most of you got an opportunity. When, we, when you got your ticket, you should have had a link to two different um, talks by Douglas Tallamy. If you didn't watch those previously, please go back and watch one or the other. Um, they're, they're both can be relatively similar. But he does just an excellent job of communicating how we can be a part of the solution with converting our suburban lawns into very healthy habitat for local wildlife. Um, and this trees are certainly a big part of that. So thank you for joining. I just want to say it's so good to see everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. And uh, we're going to have, when we go back, we're going to go back into the main session. And there, we're going to hang around for 30 minutes. If you have um, any other questions, uh, most of the speakers should be there that we can either just chat amongst ourselves or we can tackle some more questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Julie and Brendan. And I, I think the, uh, looks like people are going back. Okay. Brendan and Julie, how did yeah. your presentation go? I was jumping around between all presentations. Somebody else is gonna have to tell me because I can't say it for myself. It, I had a little trouble initially moving um, slides, but then I realized that the problem was I couldn't do it with the keyboard. I had to use the mouse. But other than that, it went smoothly. I did have a couple of um, slides that were really warped. Um, yeah, the, that, that happened to Laura as well. Okay. But it was like two slides maybe at, at mm -hmm. most. All right, I'm going to, I guess we just leave the room, right? Yes. Okay. We'll see you back at the main room.